This episode is brought to you by Call of War. Call of War is the free online PvP strategy game played by millions of users worldwide. In the game, you can join the war with the country of your choice and fight other players in epic real-time battles. Conquer the world in challenging games over several weeks with up to 100 real players per map. Start in historically accurate World War II environments and rewrite history as you want it. In battle, use the strengths and weaknesses of different unit types such as tanks, planes, and ships. Choose your own strategy to dominate your enemies, tank rush your opponents, establish air superiority, or bombard coastal cities. As you grow stronger, you can also invest in the research tree to use atomic bombs and other devastating weapons from World War II. Build an empire by conquering provinces, capture capitals, and take over entire countries. Win by waging war on your neighbors and forming strategic alliances with other players from around the world. Call of War is fully cross-platform, so you can play with the same account on PC or mobile. We've set up a special game of Call of War for the first viewers that click the link in the description. Click the link below, type Simple History in the search bar, and enter the code Simple History. The slots are limited, so don't miss out. Click our link in the description below to get 13,000 gold and one month of High Command subscription for free, available only for 30 days. The Americans that fought for Germany in World War II, 1933 to 1945. Before he had declared war on the USA on December 11, 1941, Hitler held the view that it was a decadent country plagued by racial problems and social inequalities. It is widely known that Hitler and his entourage were watching American movies, but for the German public they were banned for fear of spreading decadence. In the Fuhrer's opinion, the Democrat Franklin D. Roosevelt was a nuisance who was not leading America properly. He also discounted the United States due to its neutrality laws and their America First policy of isolationism. Though he believed that the final conflict for world hegemony would be fought between Nazi Germany and the USA, he underestimated his future enemy. So, with World War II rapidly approaching, he pleaded that the Volksdeutsch, people of German heritage outside the Reich, should return home to the fatherland and help defend it. Many German immigrants who came to America still bitterly remembered the anti-German hysteria that swept across the United States towards the end of World War I. Many things associated with Germany were boycotted. When America declared war on Germany, public pressure brought to an end most German-language newspapers, German-specific social and cultural activities, and the use of the German language in the service of the Lutheran and Reformed churches. In many places, even Beethoven was banned. In 1914, 24% of American high school students studied the German language. Later on, German language courses practically disappeared from schools. Streets, neighborhoods, suburbs, towns, foods, and breeds of dogs lost their German names. Many families with German surnames Americanized or Anglicized them or at least changed the names of their businesses. Dachshunds became Liberty Hounds. At one stage, the sellers of sauerkraut were forced to give it the more American patriotic name of Liberty Cabbage. Resentment started to grow among some German Americans about how they had been treated during this time, as they reflected on how the German language and culture was admired by many Americans before the outbreak of the First World War. There was a growing admiration of how Germany had eventually recovered after the war under the National Socialist German Workers' Party to become a new dynamic and reinvigorated nation. So, German Americans once again became proud of their heritage and through such organizations as the German American Bund, reconnected with their Germanic roots. But this also meant that these immigrants were being more and more exposed to a glamorized version of German National Socialism. This was due to the German government in the 1930s having established strong links with the German-American Bund, which had gained popularity, which in turn was becoming increasingly more fanatical and nationalistic in nature. So many felt it was their patriotic duty to return to Germany when it went to war with Britain in 1940. Each year in the 30s, many more Germans were returning to Germany from America than were emigrating there. It was the reverse of the previous trend. Those that did were mostly absorbed into combat units and fought alongside their new fellow countrymen. George Nafziga wrote in his German Order of Battle that the Waffen-SS had five U.S. Volksdeutsch, Americans of German descent, However, a lot of documentation regarding the immigration and repatriation of such soldiers did not survive the war. 
Such documents were kept in major cities that were bombed and are now lost in history. Therefore, the number of American Germans who went to fight for Germany during World War II is impossible to estimate. But some were put to specialist use as propaganda tools. Typical of this was Herbert Bergman, who was born in Minnesota to German immigrant parents. He had served in the U.S. State Department, and when the war broke out between Germany and the United States, he went to work as a broadcaster in Berlin for the German-English language radio station, Die Bunk, which claimed to be the voice of all free America, transmitting from somewhere in the Midwest, but in reality broadcast from Bremen, Germany. After the war, he was convicted of 13 acts of treason. His defense was that he had been insane at the time and he had been bullied into doing the broadcast by the Gestapo. Nevertheless, he was sentenced to between 6 and 20 years in prison and died in federal custody in 1953. But by far the most notorious of these lost sons of the Reich was Martin James Monty, an American from Missouri whose mother was of German heritage. In 1942, he joined the United States Air Force and had qualified to fly the P-38 Lightning and P-39 Era Cobra. Monty ended up being promoted to first lieutenant but his loyalty seemed to always be to the new Germany. So when he ended up being stationed abroad to India in August 1944, he deserted. He managed to get a lift on a military cargo plane to Cairo, Egypt, then caught a follow-on flight to Tripoli, Libya. Afterward, he talked himself aboard a plane to the Allied-occupied Italian city of Naples. After a few days of maneuvering, he managed to requisition a Lockheed F-5E Lightning for a test flight. He stole this newly repaired American reconnaissance plane and defected to the Germans. The Luftwaffe quickly replaced the aircraft's U.S. markings and gave it a new call sign before sending it to Germany, where the repurposed plane served its new owners through to the war's end. At first, Monty was given work as a propaganda broadcaster in a propaganda unit called SS Standard Kutegas, under a pseudonym Captain Martin Weithaupt. In his broadcasts, he tried to convince American combat troops that the USA should fight alongside Nazi Germany against the Soviet Union. However, after only a few speeches, his job was changed to writing propaganda leaflets that were distributed to Allied prisoners of war. Monty even became an Untersturmführer in the Waffen-SS and was ordered to fight in northern Italy in April 1945. Shortly after his arrival in early May, the American-born Waffen-SS officer in German uniform surrendered to the U.S. 5th Army in Milan and tried to convince them that he was an escaped American POW. At first, Monty was court-martialed for being AWOL and for misappropriation of the F-5E Lightning. He was found guilty and sentenced to 15 years of hard labor. At that early stage, prosecutors did not know of his defection or his propaganda activities on behalf of Germany. In early February 1946, President Harry S. Truman commuted his sentence to time served, contingent on his re-enlistment in the Air Force as a private. Monty did so and within two years had climbed to the rank of sergeant. Meanwhile, the Army intelligent officials poring over captured records in Germany uncovered evidence of his contribution to the Nazi war effort. On November 1, 1947, a Washington Post reporter broke the story. On January 26, 1948, minutes after the Army granted Monty an honorable discharge, the FBI arrested him. After psychiatrists deemed Monty fit to stand trial, a federal grand jury indicted him for 21 overt acts of treason. The minimum penalty was a five-year prison term and a $10,000 fine. The maximum was death. Monty, during the trial, pleaded guilty. The judge imposed a prison sentence of 25 years and a fine of $10,000. Now, we will never know how many of those Americans with German heritage had responded to the call to return to the fatherland. It was not just answered from America, but also from around the world, though most likely in very small numbers. This episode was brought to you by Call of War. Conquer the world in challenging games over several weeks with up to 100 real players per map. Start in historically accurate World War II environments and rewrite history as you want it. Call of War is fully cross-platform, so you can play with the same account on PC or mobile. Click on our link in the description below to get 13,000 gold and one month of high-command subscription for free. Only available for 30 days.